When I was in junior high, I read a news article that discussed how African ranchers would poison and shoot lions, hyenas, and painted dogs for killing livestock. At this point, I knew I wanted to do something to protect both wildlife and people. I am now in my 10th year of upper level education, or as I fondly say, the 22nd grade. And I am working on conservation solutions. However, instead of focusing on African carnivores, I study something much closer to home. The species I primarily focus on is the wolverine. And I wish, but I am not talking about Hugh Jackman. How many of you are familiar with wolverines? OK, we've got some people. Wolverines are unique for a few reasons. They are, the, they are the largest weasel in the United States, placing them in the same family as otters, badgers, and the common household ferret. Wolverines are incredibly snow adapted, with large snowshoe-like paws and a thick, oily coat. This species has the Latin name gulo gulo, which means glutton. And they are referred to as the glutton due to their poor eating etiquette and voracious appetites, something we share. <laughs> it is unlikely that you will ever see a wolverine. I haven't in the three years I've been studying them. There are a few hundred wolverines across Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Washington, with a single bachelor wolverine named Buddy living in California. There have been controversies about listing wolverines under the Endangered Species Act. Listing an animal requires both attainable conservation goals and a process by which to reach those goals. For wolverines, it was determined that there is simply not enough information to make a listing decision. When the most, or when the most recent listing decision was halted, state agencies and university researchers came together to increase our knowledge. My work began with this collaboration. In my research, I have found that wolverines face the greatest threats when they are dispersing or moving between habitats. Wolverines are born around Valentine's Day. Once they're old enough, they leave their natal homes to find their own territory, which is pretty terrifying for a young wolverine. It'd be like, say, when you move out of your parents' house, which not all of us always have done. But instead, imagine that you had to cross an extremely hot desert with no water and dangerous animals were trying to eat you. I don't know about you, but I'd probably stay home forever. In our wolverine's case, they have to leave because there may not be enough food for them to survive and they would never find a mate. This sounds like a pretty terrifying reality for both wolverines and people, but this is an apt metaphor for any species that lives in a fragmented habitat. An animal in a fragmented habitat has to cross extremely harsh and risky conditions to get to resources like food and water and find a potential mate. For wolverines, this means crossing low elevation, privately owned land to get to suitable places to live. To give you an example of how amazing these animals are at moving, we can look at M56, a young male radio collared wolverine. In the data set that I used to analyze wolverine movements, each animal was fit with a radio collar. If you are asking the question, how do you put a radio collar on a wolverine? You are not alone. <laughs> Long story short, it involves a little log cabin structure with an automatically closing lid, bait in the form of roadkill, and a very patient team of researchers with a veterinarian to sedate and collar an extremely upset 30-pound glorified ferret. <laughs> but let's get back to the story of M56. M56 was collared in northwestern Wyoming in 2008 and moved to Colorado in 2009. His journey was approximately 500 miles long. M56 stayed in Colorado until his tracking signal was lost three years later in 2012. Then, four years later and 700 miles away, M56 was legally shot and killed by a ranch hand in North Dakota. M56 was the first wolverine recorded in North Dakota in 150 years. While this story ends in heartbreak, my research is intended to prevent stories like this. If we can predict where and how we expect an animal to move, we can, we can facilitate conservation and make sure that we facilitate movements of wolverines through these habitats. 
I specifically focus on, on connectivity or the, or the pathways that animals may take when moving between patches of high elevation habitat uh, or a suitable land. For wolverines, this means high elevation habitat. However, maintaining habitat connectivity presents several challenges. First, the scale that the wolverine metapopulation functions over is large and covers several states. Second, these pathways are primarily on low elevation, privately owned land. Third, these pathways may shift in the future due to climate and land use change. And fourth, current models of wolverine connectivity do not account for these changes. Fortunately, the pathways that we expect animals to use can be modeled and predicted. If we can estimate where and how we expect an animal to move, we can, we can protect these vital animal highways through low elevation, privately owned land. I use a program to model how animals move and can use the outputs to facilitate conservation. Using these outputs, I can identify specific places that connect habitat for species of interest, like wolverines. Using these outputs, I can generate maps, and these maps can be used for conservation to identify areas at risk where animals may run into trouble. By generating these maps, I am creating tangible conservation gains for wolverines, and I can identify areas that may disproportionately compromise connectivity of the population. Using these maps, I can sit down with other researchers and point to a particular spot on the map and say, this area is really important if we want wolverines to be able to move from, say, Glacier to Yellowstone. By working alongside a number of researchers and other collaborators, I am also putting these maps in the hands of a number of groups, including land managers, land trusts, private landowners, and state agencies, so that wolverine conservation is being implemented by a larger number of groups. By working alongside these managers and, and, and other agencies, we can make sure that we are facilitating wolverine conservation. Protecting these corridors also means protecting potential corridors for other species, like grizzly bears that may use these pathways. These pathways are essential to the persistence of most species globally. Connectivity conservation is on the forefront of ecological research, and the number of people thinking about these issues continues to grow daily. Without connectivity conservation, we will continue to see the loss of large charismatic species. Thank you.